attend to something. So if um, maybe she'll be able to, to share her own um, takeaway from week one at the end. Um, so yes, it's time for our guest speaker, Lola. <laughs> to just talk to us about tips on taking care of your mental health. So Lola, with your Zen background, you have the floor. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Hello, ladies. It's so very nice to put faces to the name and all that. It's lovely to be here. And just um, as a side note, for the left-handed people, there's actually a store in San Francisco for left-handed, they only do lefty, lefty stuff. So I know sometimes it can be hard to mail to Africa. I don't even know if they do Nigeria, places like that, because you know this way in Mubu, they can be very somehow, somehow. <laughs> but they do have a store. And when I found it, it was like, oh my God. So scissors, mugs, all kinds of things for left-handed people. Wow. You can find it. And they do have a website. Uh, but I, the thing is, I don't, again, I don't know if they mail all the way to Nigeria and things like that. So, but there is a store that caters to left-handed people. So just so you know, hopefully that will go around the world, but yes, that's mental idea. health. That's a business idea. Entrepreneurs here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so mental health. Um, I think it, a lot of the things that we've been talking about, you know, actually really resonates with what our mental health is supposed to be. One of the big things, you know, um, uh, who World Health Organization, one of the things that they say is that there is no health without mental health, right? It is key to our overall health because we do know that when, you know, when the mental health is not there, the physical health will deteriorate and vice versa. If the physical health is not there, the mental health will deteriorate. And so they go hand in hand. So the mind and the body. So a lot of you that do yoga, you know, mindfulness, you already know about the mind-body connection, right? They are one and the same. They're in sync. So when one is not working properly, the other follows suit very quickly. So all the things that we have been doing is a really good idea to help keep our mental health intact and to optimize it. So when we look at mental health, it is more than the absence of or presence of mental illness. So again, when people sometimes consider mental health, many people think mental illness. But the reality is mental health is just a state of successful performance for our mental function functioning, uh, which helps us to be more productive in our lives, uh, to have fulfilling relationships with other people. And it also gives us the ability to adapt to change and to cope with challenges that come. So from some of you that have been talking about when you did the meditation, you were able to handle your stresses, you know, starting off your day, right? You, you don't feel as overwhelmed versus when you don't. So that is taking care of your mental health already. And we also know that, you know, in terms of uh, mental health being, uh, it's when we don't take care of our mental health, it can lead to other mental problems. So mental health issues like depression, uh, anxiety, uh, stress, burnout, all these kinds of things can be, you know, part of the problems that develop as a result of not taking care of our mental health. And, you know, statistically, of the leading causes of disability worldwide, five are mental disorders. So we're not even looking at, you know, cancer. Yes, cancer is one and all these other physical health issues, but five uh, mental disorders, which means a lot of people are not taking care of their mental health in the way that they should be doing. And major depression is number one of the five. So depressive illnesses are the leading cause of disease burden in developed countries, but now more so in, you know, in developing countries as well. Um, and what are the causes of mental health problems? There are many causes. Uh, when we look at mental health issues, we're looking at the biopsychosocial spiritual because there is also now a lot of research that's, you know, talking about people, you know, struggling spiritually as well. So I know when I was taking my program, it, which is counseling and spirituality, that's one of the things that came up is a lot of people will come into therapy, but they're looking for, you know, spiritual 
resources. They're looking for questions about existential issues. What is the meaning of life and all these kinds of things. And so we know that a lot of those things are also impactful when we don't have them. So biopsychosocial, spiritual, we're looking at physical health, biological, um, family relationships, so our family of origin, what are some of the things we learned from there? What are some of the problems arising from there that impact our mental health? Uh, for a lot of people, trauma, uh, coping skills, do we have them? Do we not have them? Social skills, school, um, work situations, uh, peer relationships, family circumstances, uh, financial issues. These are all things that can impact our mental health. And then we also look at, uh, there is a research ongoing right now, it's been ongoing for a while, what's called the ACEs study. And that is the adverse childhood experiences. And basically what that is, is that in our family of origin, you know, we experience all kinds of different things that can then impact us as we get older. So the more ACEs score you have, the more likely that you would experience mental health issues when you're older. And so they do have a a form to kind of check off the ACEs uh, score and get your ACEs score. I will send that link in the um, in the group chat because I don't have it here with me. But that's one of the things. So when you look at that list, and I think a lot of us, you know, would probably resonate with some of the things on those on those lists. But the, the beauty of it is that the more that we start to take care of ourselves now, the more resilience we can build and the more productive and more... Um, healthy we can be mentally and physically uh so that those are some of the things in terms of our mental health that can be impactful and then when we look at other situations that can impact our mental health i know that you know it seems like a lot of people here are ceos they're you're running your own thing which is a beautiful thing you know but sometimes when you work in a working environment where there are other people there might be bullying there might be you know, people who are trying to do, take advantage. So all those things impact us as well. They impact the way we experience ourselves. They impact the way we experience other people. And so they can, in fact, lead to mental health problems. And then we have uh, addictions. Hopefully none of us here will subscribe to that. But, you know, there are addictions to many different things. So again, when people hear of, of addictions, they think, oh, addiction to alcohol or to drugs. But realistically, a person could be addicted to working too much. A person could be addicted to food. A person could be addicted. See somebody smiling over there. You know, a person could be addicted to all kinds of things. You know, and again, what these can do is they can impact our mental health uh, as well. So being mindful of all those kinds of things uh, and then loneliness, you know, sometimes a person could be lonely, even in a group of people. Right. And we hear about it a lot. Even, you know, in, in North America, there's a lot of people who are reporting that they're lonely, even though they're in within families, you know, in Britain, I think, uh, I think 2017 or somewhere around that they appointed a minister of loneliness because there were just a lot of people recording that they're being, they're lonely, you know, so loneliness is a real thing, you know, and this is why platforms like this are actually super helpful because when you're able to come together and, you know, just relate with other people and, you know, find things in common with people and explore, it's very, very helpful. So, you know, loneliness is another thing that is very worldwide, look, making people more depressed, more anxious. And it's crazy what can happen when we experience these kinds of things. Peer pressure. These are things that can impact our mental health. Uh, when a person, you know, again, just as we are here, I think I heard somebody talk earlier about when they look at other people, you know, they're comparing themselves to that other person and that is peer pressure when you see people around you 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 want to look like them you're constantly comparing yourself that is some sort of peer pressure and again what that does is it affects our mental health issues so right off the bat you have low self-esteem you have no confidence in yourself you know but the beauty of this is you know again when we do affirmations when we're constantly just focusing on ourselves bringing that compassion to ourselves rather than to you know other people and stopping to compare which we'll talk about in a little bit you know that can make a huge impact on our um 
on our well-being, mental well-being, as well as our, you know, self-esteem and self-confidence levels. You know, so peer pressure is a huge thing. The other thing that impacts our mental health issues, media, social media, you know, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, whatever else is there. There's so many right now that it's not even funny. I heard it two new ones yesterday that I hadn't even heard of in my life. I'm like, what is this world coming to? But these things impact us because then you're seeing on these platforms, you know, people that, you know, are uh, uh, photoshopping their bodies. You know, there is actually the one of the ones I heard about yesterday. You can't even post anything on there without it shipping you and, you know, molding you into whatever. So, automatically it photoshops you before it can even allow you to post anything so there's a lot on social media that is you know we see it it seems perfect but we don't know what's behind you know what they're doing or whatever is going on and so then we start to compare ourselves to all these kinds of people you know I've had people come in and they're like well you know they want to be like this they want to be like that I'm like well you can't be like that person first of all because you don't have enough money they have private chefs they have all these kinds of things that help them they have a private uh, trainer you, you don't have that one so you cannot compare yourself to all these kinds of people right so it's important to be mindful of those things yet social media calls us to do that all the time when we see things on social media we're constantly comparing we want to be that the grass is greener on the other side even if it's fake grass nobody knows right so it impacts self-esteem it impacts our mental health it, it overwhelms us is what it does and one of the things that have actually in the research that's ongoing right now studies have shown that social media and media influences the increased likelihood of individuals developing restlessness and distractibility and so we're finding more and more people are you know being uh diagnosed with ADHD, ADD, even though there is nothing other than social media that's causing, because it's it's a restless thing when you're picking up your phone one million times. And the average person right now, actually research, I think says about 300 and something, between 300 and something to 500, the average person picks up their phone in a day. That's a lot. And so what that means is we're constantly going from one thing to another, one thing to another, without actually really finishing anything. And so the brain is very, very disgruntled. It's very disjointed. It's, you know, it's just so split. And so we're finding a lot of restlessness between people, amongst people rather. And then on healthy comparisons, as I said earlier, there is cyberbullying, uh, you know, social media, there has been a lot of... Uh, in this part of the world, there's been a few cases ongoing, actually, where, you know, a person has been bullied so much that they committed suicide. And it's not just bullying of they're being bullied in school, they're being bullied online as they're on their social media, you know, where people are saying things to them, you know, so all these kinds of things impact us. The other thing is higher levels of um, anxiety and depression, poor sleep habits, because when you have your phone with you 24-7, you can't drop it. You can't allow yourself, you don't allow yourself to sleep or you're so much on it that, you know, your brain cannot settle down enough to sleep, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about that later too. When your brain cannot settle down enough to sleep, what that means is you're getting very few amount time hours of sleep and then you're not even getting quality sleep. So social media is huge. Being able to manage how one time on social media is important. And then, as I said earlier, compromise self-esteem, confidence issues, and poor body image. Because everybody on social media has a great body, even though they, you know, they photoshopped it, they <laughs> did all kinds of stuff to it. And I don't know, I think most of you will know Pretty Woman. It's a very popular movie. You know, and one of the things in that movie, you'll see Julia Roberts, she has these really fantastic long legs. But apparently, a, a long time ago, I was doing a study because I was doing a presentation like this. And I found that Julia Roberts, it wasn't actually her legs that they used in the movie. It was somebody else's. So, you know, with movies and all kinds of stuff, they can edit them. And so you can see the top of her, but the bottom was not her. I'm like, oh my God. And so somebody would watch that and want to be like that or on magazine pictures, there are about five faces on a magazine picture, you know, so then you see this picture, you want to be like this person, but there is no way you can because it's all been manipulated to be so perfect by using many different 
faces of different models, you know? So all these things, when we're not aware of them, what they create is a whole lot of self-esteem issues. And then when we're looking at um, more impact of, of, of mental health issues, it's envy, you know? Um, it used to be that people would say comparison is a th thrift of joy, but again, one of the things that leads to comparison or maybe is uh, the but the root of comparison really is envy. When we envy what others have, when we're not satisfied with what we have, it leads to competition, it leads to discontent, it leads to joylessness. And so being able to be mindful of those kinds of things is very, very helpful. And again, in platforms like this where we're keeping each other accountable, everybody is having is contributing one way or the other. We're learning from each other. It makes it easier, but it also can be a trap, you know, for envy to, you know, be a thing that grows. And so it's important to be mindful of that and just really celebrate each other, which is the antidote to that, uh, obviously, and maybe not so obviously, but it is the antidote to, you know, envy and comparison is to be able to celebrate other people trusting that you know your time will come depending on what is going on or even talking to another person and asking you know I really admire how you got that you know could you help me along things like that and I think this is what this group is for to be able to encourage each other and lift each other up like that so these kinds of things are helpful when we're able to talk to one another and you know have that social socialization that helps us to promote each other so to speak, which then builds our confidence levels and builds our productivity levels and all kinds of things. And the other thing that can be quite impactful too is, um, uh, what is it? Not So we'll, we'll come to the embracing the inner child, but I know somebody talked about that earlier. And this again goes to the family of origin. Sometimes the inner child goes into hiding, right? Because it just does not feel safe to come and be its natural self. And so when we're talking about, you know, improving our mental health, it is important to embrace our inner child. But I will come back to that. I want to talk about a few of the things that we can be doing, some of which we're already doing. And as I said earlier, some common mental health problems, you know, depression, anxiety, panic disorders, phobias, which are, you know, massive fears of all kinds of different things. We have obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders. So these are common mental health problems. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the warning signs, um, which can include, but not limited to eating or sleeping too much or too little, pulling away from people and usual activities. So when you find that you're not interested in activities that you used to be interested in, you know, you just don't find any joy, that could be a sign. Uh, yeah. having low or no energy that also can be a sign feeling numb or like nothing matters feeling hopeless or helpless having unexplained aches and pains and this is important because for a lot of black women especially we don't experience depression and anxiety in the regular way we experience it in form of aches and pains and so when you find that you're having unexplained aches and pains, it's important to check in with yourself, see what's going on. If you need to talk to a doctor, do that, because that's the way that we generally, because the woman does a lot, you know, so you don't even have time to think, oh, what else is going on? But you you know, a lot of women, and I heard this growing up, you know, my grandmother would talk about pains that she was experiencing that absolutely nothing could explain, you know, but then having, you know, grown up in, you know, in this field that I'm in, I'm recognizing that for a lot of Black women, they actually experience, because it's almost as if you can't stop, you just got to keep going, but you still keep experiencing these pains that really have no physical component to them. So it's important to be mindful of those kinds of things. Uh, having uh, having feeling helpless and hopeless, uh, as I said earlier, that can be another warning sign. Feeling confused, uh, forgetful, on edge, angry, upset, worried, scared. These are all common warning signs that there might be a mental health issue that needs to be addressed. Yelling or fighting with family members, with friends, experiencing severe mood swings that cause problems in relationship. Um, having persistent thoughts and memories you can't get out of your head. So ruminating on certain thoughts. Uh, uh, sometimes for some people, hearing voices or believing things that are not true, 
thinking about harming yourself or, or others, not being able to perform daily tasks or not being able to take care of yourself or your kids or getting to work or school. These are some common warning signs that we can be mindful of. And uh, just again, in day-to-day -day activities, when you just find that you have no energy at all, you don't wanna do anything, you don't wanna talk to anybody, that's a warning sign that maybe you're overwhelmed, maybe you're feeling burnt out. It's time to maybe take a step back, get back into the routine of the things that you've done that was helpful for you, you know? And so it's important to be mindful of those kinds of things. Uh, also, uh, what else was there that I wanted to mention? The stigmas, the stigmas and misconceptions, you know, that sometimes we have around mental health issues. You know, oftentimes people don't seek help because of the stigmas and misconceptions. And, you know, here, I, I I hope that we can have a little bit of time to discuss. I know that here in North America, as much as they propagate, you know, mental health, take care of yourself, things like that, there is still quite a bit of stigma. And I imagine that it's so in Nigeria too, you know, where you might say, or in other places where people are at, you know, you're feeling a certain type of way and somebody will tell you to just get over it. Nobody takes it seriously. You know, so those stigmas prevent people from getting the help that they actually do need. So it's important to, if you're feeling a certain type of way, find a trusted person to talk to and find, you know, if you can find a doctor, a therapist, or, you know, just a trusted friend that you can share things with. We know that when we share a burden with another, it makes it lighter, you know. So in those kinds of situations, let's remember to just be mindful that we can share things with, you know, some trusted people. And that kind of takes away from the stigma. So as not to suffer in silence. And, you know, when people think of mental health, as I said earlier, they either think it's, you know, you're mentally ill or you're mentally healthy. But we know that even people who are, you know, are considered mentally ill, like, for example, people who have uh, schizophrenia and things like that, many of them actually, when they're in treatment, they live healthy lives right? Even more than those of us who don't have those kinds of things that are not taking care of ourselves. So then there is this, you know, uh, gap or bridge where this person over here, yes, they may have schizophrenia, but they're living a beautiful life. They're productive they're, because they're on medication, they're in treatment and all that versus somebody who doesn't have that diagnosis, but is struggling and feeling overwhelmed a lot and, in, and is not reaching out for the help. So they're struggling more than the person who has a mental uh, illness uh, per se, right? So it's important to be mindful that mental health issues don't always mean mental illness. And when we're taking care of ourselves, we have the opportunity to, you know, lead more productive lives and just be able to attend to our lives in a, it show up for ourselves basically in, in a more healthy way. Mental health issues is not a sign of weakness, neither is mental illness, especially if they're in treatment. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not an excuse for poor behavior because sometimes you'll hear things like that too, you know, that it's a sign of weakness, which also prevents people from reaching out for help. You know, we know that there is a lot of people who have mental health issues. And I often refer to the Bible because I do a lot of presentation with churches, which, you know, is the place where people will say it's because of your sin or whatever. No, a mental health issue is not because you have a sin. It's not because you're weak. It's not anything that has to do with that. It's just as life happens, we live in a fallen world. Unfortunately, there are many stresses you know, and every day there is something that you have to deal with. But if you're dealing with all those things and you're not taking care of yourself, then you will struggle, you know. So being able to also identify for yourself that you're not struggling. And, you know, when I present in churches, I always say in, in the Bible, we have many examples of people who had a lot of troubles. You know, David was anointed to be king. I think he was maybe pre-18 when he was anointed. He didn't get to the throne until he was 30. You know, and all through his kingship, he was running helter skelter. Can can you imagine the stress that man must have been under? And hence, all the psalms that he wrote, you would find each one of them. He was constantly telling God about his distress, or you know. But at the end of the day, the Bible tells us he encouraged himself in the Lord. You know, and that's one of the things that we need to remember. So yes, we will struggle, but it doesn't mean that we have sinned. 
you know, and even when he sinned, he was quick to go back to the Lord and say, I have sinned and I know this is why this is happening. So sometimes, yes, but it's not all the time that, you know, your struggle is a result of your sin. And so it's important to be mindful of that and dispel all those misconceptions about mental health. Uh, mental health issues, are not, they're not necessarily violent. Sometimes if, if a person has an actual mental illness like uh, schizophrenia, they may be violent if they're not on medication, but that is rarely the case, you know. So again, that's another misconception why people often are like, oh, just over there, don't come near us. But realistically, these are even not very, very, they're very rare in, 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 in these situations. And mental health problems are not forever. We know that the only constant thing in life is change. Things always change. Things always transform. And the more that we're able to reach out to people, the more that we're able to reach out for support, our lives can be transformed. You know, so being mindful that, you know, even if you're struggling right now, this is not the end. As long as God still gives you breath in your in your nostrils, it is not the end. Things can still change when we're reaching out for the right kinds of help. And so what are some of the things that we can be doing to prevent or to optimize our mental health. You know, they always say treatment is great, but prevention is always better. And studies around the world have proved over and over again that we are able to prevent mental health problems or mitigate the effects of mental illness and allow people to have fulfilling, productive lives in the community. And so the number one thing, I always talk about three things in terms of optimizing your mental health. We've talked about it a lot on this platform. The number one is sleep. You got to sleep. There is a reason why God created sleep. Jesus himself slept. He was in the boat. He was sleeping because he was. we need to sleep. Because one of the things that sleep does for us is it regenerates our bodies. When you sleep, you're healing your mind. You're healing your soul. The brain is able to do everything it needs to do to keep, you know, your body functional and your mind functional. So sleep is extremely important. It is a catch-all that benefits your physical, mental, and emotional health. You'll find that sometimes when kids don't sleep well in the morning, they're more hyperactive or they're more irritable, you know, because they haven't slept well. And it's the same thing with us adults. When I don't sleep well, I know it's in my body. I'm just like, oh man, this day, <laughs> this day is not going to go the way I want it to go because I haven't slept well. And sleep is really, really important. And so when you're looking at the quantity and the quality of sleep, they're both very important. The average adult needs seven to nine hours of sleep. So we're looking at 19 to 64 years old. Uh, the teen years, they need about eight to 10. And then the younger ones, you know, nine to 12, depending on the ages and things like that. The, the babies, we all know that this, that's all they do is sleep, eat and, you know, poop. <laughs> so they, they, they're sleeping about 18 hours, which again is important for their development, right? And it's the same thing for us. Just because we're adults does not mean we need any less sleep. And, you know, the research around the world right now is a lot of people are sleep deficient. And what is happening right now as a result of that is they're finding that some people are developing Alzheimer's, you know, Parkinson's, because when you're not sleeping, when you're not sleeping, your brain is not able to wash out the toxins it needs to be washing out. You know, there are people who are having heart attacks at work, you know, things like that, because they just sleep so sleep deprived. So sleep is number one. And some tips to sleep better, I know that we've been talking about it a lot, is number one is to create a consistent sleep routine. God help me, I'm still working on that. <laughs> some days are better than others, you know, but having a consistent sleep routine. So where you go to bed at the same time every night and you wake up at the same time every morning. This is super important because it teaches your body, again, for people who have trouble sleeping, sometimes when you have, when you develop that consistent sleep routine, it tells your body, okay, it's time to sleep and it knows what to do. It does it. Uh, eliminating caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, avoiding them hours before bedtime. We talked about that yesterday when somebody brought up the coffee thing. So hours ahead of time. When you know your body and checking in with your body is really important because you'll know what it needs at any given time. I often say to my clients, your body is constantly talking to you. It's constantly telling you what it needs. If you're listening, you'll know it, you know, so really paying attention to our bodies to find out what it needs at any given time. 
Exercising regularly is very important. Uh, stretches before bedtime can be very helpful for sleep. So it helps you to sleep longer, stay asleep longer, and you know have a good quality of sleep. Keeping the bedroom dark and free of distractions and using it only for sleep and sex, right? So your bedroom, if there is nothing else going on in there other than sleeping and sex, that's, that's all. Your brain again knows when we enter into here, we're here to sleep, right? And the sex is an added benefit because it actually produces oxytocin and all those feel-good hormones that help you sleep better as well. All right. So and then when we're looking at um, prayer, meditation, guided imagery, deep breathing exercises, these are all things that can also be very helpful in helping us sleep well. Right. And the research on prayer is massive. You know how it's been known to help people. And I'll come to that in a little bit. And then just being having a wind down routine. You know, many a times we just get off of our in, uh, social media and then it's off to bed. There is no wind down routine. So having some sort of wind down routine can be very helpful. And for everyone that looks different. So it might look like, you know, washing your face, getting to your pajamas, having a cup of tea, things like that. Everybody can come up with their own different things, whatever works for you. That can be very helpful. And then eating well, you know, again, this platform has been uh, propagating that eat well, eat healthy. It's helpful, you know, eating less crap. So carbonated drinks, refined sugar, artificial sweeteners and colors, processed foods, eating less of those things and eating more food, fruits and vegetables, organic lean protein, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, drinking water. You know, we cannot even exaggerate the importance of water in our lives our body is mostly water and when one, when we don't drink enough we are dehydrated which also impacts the way we feel about ourselves you know you feel sluggish you feel you know just don't have that energy so drinking water is huge and then the next thing is exercise it's again been propagated it's all the things that you're doing so exercising and one of the beautiful things about exercise is for the most part, it can be free. You can do it in the, in, you know, in the confines of your home. And the research out right now is that exercise is actually shown to be more powerful than antidepressants if you're doing it consistently. So there's a study that they gave people antidepressants for depression. And then the the second group of people that had depression, they just put them on an exercise routine. And they found that they felt better than the ones who were on antidepressants. And then months later, when they checked in on them, they were still feeling much better than those who were on antidepressants. So exercise, sometimes it might feel like, oh, I don't want to do it, you know, but the more we do it, the more we help our mental health. And then we talk about uh, social interaction, getting out and hanging out with people, you know, talking to people. Uh, just having interaction with other people because the world of social media right now and just, you know, internet and, and the web, it has, as much as we have, you know, we have a shortcut to everybody, everything we have access to here and there, but most people are spending so much more time on their phones. They're not actually hanging out with people, which is the leading cause of loneliness. And also just, you know, if you're not interacting with other people regularly, there are no hugs, nothing you're depriving yourself and studies show again too that that kind of thing can it can you know it leaves some parts of our brain left unused you know when we don't have people that are touching us you know hugging us the, the hugs that we get from people they're so powerful because just even in that interaction alone hugging another person it releases feel good hormones that just help you feel good you know so social interaction is huge and anytime that you're call to go out and interact, please do so because you're helping your well-being, physical, emotional, and, and social and mental, right? So social connectedness, it creates a positive feedback loop in these kinds of situation. So taking social media breaks. I know, I think I saw in somebody's uh, habit tracker, they wanted to take a social media break. I completely 100% support that because it helps when we're not on our phones constantly. It helps us settle the mind. It helps us to get other things done. So taking social media breaks as much as possible can be very helpful. Uh, becoming a social media or media critic in the sense of what are you being sold on social media? 
every time you're on social media, you're being sold something, right? Again, when you look on your phones, Facebook, whatever, you know, as a matter of fact, the research that's coming out right now says that we are now the commodity, right? We're being sold to companies. We're being sold to whoever it is, Nike, you know, Gucci, whatever, because every time you pick up your phone, they're there. You know, whatever you talk about, as I mentioned Gucci now, the next ad that will come up on my phone will be a Gucci ad because this is the way that we're being sold to people. You know, so being a critique of who who am I being marketed to and what are they marketing to me? It helps us to streamline our, you know, the things that we, uh, our content on social media. And it help, it really helps to just center the mind and ground us in reality. Uh, emotion regulation. And this one is a huge one in the sense of, first of all, in the world that we live in today, the only emotion that's acceptable is happy. Everybody got to be happy, but happy is not the only emotion we experience. We experience other forms of emotion, anger, sadness, fear, you know, and all these emotions are valid. They're innate to us and there is nothing wrong with them. And so I always say to people, our emotions are beautiful. The only thing we need to learn to do with them is learn to regulate them. And some of the ways that you can regulate your emotions you know, include, but not limited to, again, a lot of the things we just talked about, but also just being able to identify the emotion itself. What am I feeling right now? What's happening for me right now? Why am I feeling this way? And you can do that through journaling. You can do that through, you know, just writing things out or just sitting down and taking space for yourself to check in with yourself or talking to somebody else or in prayer, right? So we'll see even in the Bible, David did a lot of emotion regulation. He would write this, all the journals, all the things that David journaled is what we're reading today, basically in the Psalms, right? Because he would write just to eliminate all that stress. And we're reading all of that today. We're encouraged by it today. And we can do that for ourselves too. You know, we can go to the Lord in prayer. We can write prayer journals. We can do all kinds of things to help regulate our emotions. Crying is a good way of regulating emotions. You know, people talk about, well, I can't cry. I'm like, why can't you cry? You need to cry. Crying is one of the very first things you did when you entered this world. Crying is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful release to just let things go. So being able to cry can be very helpful. Uh, managing our emotions also look like regular self-care, right? When you're taking care of yourself, you're not feeling as overwhelmed and you're less likely to be irritable. You're less likely to, to be emoting, you know, to other people or projecting onto other people when you're taking care of yourself. So emotion regulation is huge. Um, Positive thinking, realistic thinking, you know, the Bible tells us that as a man thinketh, so is he, you know, and yes, the way, the things that we think about, they matter a lot, in, a lot in our lives. The next book we're going to be reading, The Power of Intention, I've heard a lot from Wayne Dyer in his, you know, uh, videos and things like that. There was a movie that he did a long time ago that I watched and it was just so transforming. So I'm really looking forward to reading the book, but it all talks about the things that we think. Whatever you focus your mind on is whatever you manifest, is whatever you magnify. And so it is important to focus your mind on the beautiful things. The Bible tells us, focus on the noble things, the pure things, the beautiful things. These are the things that help us manage our emotions and help us to really, you know, uh, manage our mental health and, and optimize our lives in the best way possible. All right. So positive, realistic thinking. If you think you can do it, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. That's just the reality. And research shows that 75 to 98 percent of current mental and physical illnesses today come from toxic thinking. And so one of the things that toxic thinking does is it throws our bodies into stress and so when, when the body is in stress, there's a, a spike in the cortisol levels in the body. And that kind of just does all kinds of different things. For some people, cortisol in the body is stored as fat. You know, some people will say, oh, I, I'm not even eating a lot I, and I can't lose all the weight, but they're under a massive amount of stress that has increased the cortisol levels in their body, which is being stored as fat. So it is important to be mindful of these kinds of things and take note of them. And just constantly check in with ourselves and be, you know, the, the toxic. This is why affirmations are good. They're super helpful. And that leads us into gratitude. When we're grateful for the things we have, we're not comparing. 
you know, when we're fostering gratitude in our lives, we're not comparing, we're content with what we have. And research tells us that, you know, gratitude shields us from negativity. It makes us 25% happier. It rewires our brain. It eliminates stress, heals us and improves sleep and relationships. So gratitude is an important thing. And finding purpose and meaning in our lives, you know, I'm so happy to hear everybody's, you know, into something or the other, you know, everybody's looking for ways to move forward this purpose, you know, and this whole uh, this whole group, this platform, I believe is to encourage that purpose to, you know, I, I see Shade encouraging people to that podcast must start. That is purpose, you know, that is having something to do that gives you, you know, a reason to get up every day. And when we have those reasons, it actually, again, helps us with our mental health. So finding purpose and meaning in life is very, is connected also to being resilient, you know, and, and research has shown that for people, retired people who find a new lease on life, find a new purpose after they have retired, it actually helps them live longer. It deters things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And so really having purpose, you know, again, not even just for the joy of I have something to do, but you have a whole, you know, new lease on life because of it. And uh, embracing your inner child, as I talked about earlier, you know, one of the things that can make us not embrace our inner child could be childhood traumas or things that we went through in our family of origin. And so what does it mean to embrace your inner child? It just means to have more fun, you know, go back to the things that used to interest you as a child. You know, sometimes even when we're talking to people who are trying to change careers or looking for something that would inspire them, we, we work with them on what are the things that you enjoy doing as a child? Because a lot of times those things can be things that you can translate into your world today that just give you so much fun and again, create a new purpose for your life. You know, so embracing your inner child in that way, being spontaneous sometimes. When you watch little children, these are our examples for inner children. You know, you'll see them, they they emote a lot. They're constantly, you know, crying or, you know, laughing or, you know, doing something that's constantly using all of their bodies. And it's because they have that freedom to just be free. But as we get older, that gets, you know, it, it starts to be silenced in us. And so then the inner child in us retreats. It doesn't feel safe to come out. So as we're doing this work, you know, I know there's a few videos that have been shared on listening to your inner child. What does it want to do today? Does it just want to be and not do anything? And, and a lot of times it just wants to do something fun or sometimes it just wants to be listened to. So being able to just embrace your inner child, you know, is another really good way of optimizing your mental health, letting go of in your inhibitions, trying things out for the first time. If you try it out for the first time, you don't like it you would have at least known that you give it a try. And that in and of itself builds confidence, right? And so being able to do those kinds of things, living in the moment, being grounded in the moment. And this is the sole purpose of mindfulness is to stay in the moment without judgment and with full acceptance of whatever is going on in your lives right now. And, and that is the practice of mindfulness in and of itself. And the other thing is just to seek counsel. You know, I like that we have this group. We're able to talk about things. We're sharing things with each other. You know, sometimes if you feel like you don't want to share with the whole group, you can talk to maybe one person or two that you trust or somebody else outside of this platform. I'm sure that you all know so many people. Seeking counsel is a very important tool in Again, we have many examples of people seeking counsel in the Bible. You know, David sought counsel all the time from the people close to him. You know, and I use David because he's really one of my favorite people in the Bible <laughs> because he had so much going on in his life. You know, but when you look at others too, you'll find that they did the same. You know, Esther sought the counsel of Mordecai. Every time that something was going on, she would. First of all, that, that's the first question go, she goes to, you know, and we have all these examples of people who seek help. They seek counsel. You know, we live in a society that tries to say, you know, just work out your issues by yourself. But nobody has ever really been able to do that without talking to another person. There are things that the Holy Spirit might impart to you, yes. And there are things that the Holy Spirit might say, go talk to that person because nobody is an island. You can't get it all done by yourself. So really use the people around you. Utilize the help that you have around you because a burden shared is a burden made lighter, right? And at the end of it all, just really... I always end with, you know, your relationship with God. It's extremely important. And we do that through prayer. 
you know, prayer is one of the greatest things that we have that helps us. Again, one of the, one of the studies that, you know, I was looking at when I did this uh, pre presentation a while back was prayer has been shown to have multitude of benefits, both mentally and physically. It is a healthy coping skill, you know, and it, it just helps. It has a way of helping us deal with the adversities and the stresses of our lives. And I think this is why, you know, the Bible encourages us to pray without ceasing because there's not anything we can do without prayer. And I just personally believe that I know that there are others that might say otherwise, but I personally believe that we cannot do a lot without prayer. You know, and this is where I will end my talk today. And there is scientific research, you know, about the importance of it. You know, one of the things before I wrap up is there was actually a study that uh, they did with cancer patients, I believe it was, you know, where even though they didn't believe or anything, but they had people praying for them versus another group of uh uh, people that weren't being prayed for they found that the people that were being prayed for were getting better and they had a whole new lease on life you know so there's a lot of things that science is really now opening our eyes to so for me science and religion they're not opposites they actually you know corroborate each other and and with the research that's you know out there today we know that there is power in prayer there is power in connection in social connection there is power in these kinds of platforms to be able to achieve the things that we want to do and so i hope that this is some things that you can take with you today to continue to optimize your mental health Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lola. Thank you so much. Um, very well. <laughs> for pouring yourself out and you know sharing all of these things. Uh, mental health is, is, is very, very important, you know, because uh, and it's something that a lot of people don't talk about. It's rare out here in um, in Nigeria. You know, people just want to we keep going. We just keep going. You said something about the way we we um, experience mental health challenges as African women, that we experience it differently through aches and pain. So yes, it's one of those, sometimes people carry so much emotions in their, in their shoulders, in their lower backs, and, and those are indications of the fact that we are, we are stressed. So um, yeah, because, I mean, a couple of us would have to go to work tomorrow. Um, so I'll just, if you have questions, um, Okay, let me see if there's anybody that has one question or two. Let's just take uh, a question and then the rest we can compile the others in the group and then Lola will take her time to, to address them one by one. In the meantime, time while we're looking out for that, Rashida joined us um, while the presentation was going on. Rashida, are you, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. right here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, now. So I, I guess now you can do your introduction, your key takeaway, and if you have tea, what tea are you having? <laughs> um, hello, ladies. Good evening. Um, sorry, uh, got in late. Um, so my name is Rashidat Awehimiraji. Um, let's see. I'm a bit winded. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm told I'm an architect, so we'll go with that. But I enjoy I enjoy a boatload of other things. Um, one of which is just uh, making other people, making people laugh. Um, I, I believe that the most beautiful thing in the world is an ugly laugh, because there are no inhibitions. Uh, let's see. My takeaway from this first week. Um, so my late dad had a saying, uh, he, he would always say Tinundu, um, he would always say, which the, uh, the best way to translate that is, um, you know, you, you don't always have to go, you know, that expression, go big or go home. It's the opposite of that. So his thing is just, just a little bit, you know, just, just doing just a little bit, you know, counts. And that's been my takeaway this week. I'm that person who, um, if I can't see it clearly, anything you're asking me to do, if I cannot see it clearly, especially if it's new for me, I'm not gonna do it. You can hem and haw all day long. <laughs> um, but this past week, especially with the atomic habits, 
it's that thing of um, uh, he had this concept about, uh, I, and I'm paraphrasing here, the the sum total of doing, you know, the aggregate of just making these minor um, contributions or just, you know, doing the smallest things. He used the um, UK bike uh, team as, as his example. And funny enough, for some reason, that was the first thing that popped up on the audio book. It didn't even start from chapter one. I don't know why, <laughs> but that was the first thing. Um, and I was like, wow. So that's been my major takeaway is you don't always have to, you know, you, you don't have to do the big things to feel accomplished. Just little by little, you know, is the, um, what is it? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So that's, that's been my takeaway this week. Still play catch up, <laughs> so hope uh, to catch up over the weekend. But um, it's it's been awesome. Um, grateful to Mofolushade uh, for the invite, and the way it happened <laughs> was a funny one. So I'm thankful. I'm gonna thank God. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. My my keywords for the year was uh, to be open and be intentional. So when she brought the invite, I'm like. Okay, well, I'm open. I'm intentional. Let's go. Uh, but it's 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 been great. Awesome. Thank I you think that's so it. much. Uh, oh, sorry. T. Uh, I haven't had it yet. I'm about to go make it. Uh, I like golden chai, so it's uh, turmeric, cinnamon, ginger, uh, all mixed in milk in warm milk. Nice. Take it before you go to bed. <laughs> Don't take it during the day because if you fall asleep, I will not be held accountable. But it's a really good sleep aid. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So we've come to the end of our Kick-Ass Mom Sunday Cup of Tea. If you're still here um, and you can put on your camera, for, I mean, I know some people uh, explain that they are um, in a dark place or whatever, but if you're, if you're in a place where it's still bright, let's just put on our camera and just show some love. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. All right. So thank you, Lola. We love you. I'm showing some virtual love. <laughs> yeah, I can see the virtual love. We're receiving it, receive it, receive it. All right. Thank you so much, everyone who stayed till the end. I will share the recording. And I, like I said, if we have any questions, we can post them on the group. Um, we can post them on the group. Lola would be um, happy to, to address and answer them. All right. So we are entering into week two from tomorrow. Please get yourselves ready. Power of Intention, Wendaya, amazing book. We're going into mind and, and stuff like mindfulness next levels okay so get yourselves ready good night everyone and thank you for coming bye bye good night good everyone. night bye thank you thank you lola good night bye good night everyone good night good night bye